Alright. Yeah. Queen. Part 10. And we're literally in it. We're not far off finishing it. It's the pen penultimate part. But yeah. Let's go. Uh, Queen played and this is really the first proper advertised gig we ever did I would think and it's certainly the first review we ever got by Rosemary Horride of what was then disc and It was a great gig It was uh, it was the, I think the first moment when I thought my god something's really happening here people actually want to see us and and they know what we're about and it was my own college We're now backstage this is the way where you go through to the stage of the great of the, the main hall this is what was the jazz club room. I have no idea what it is now. And as I remember it, there was a, there was a notice board somewhere here where you would pin items that were of interest to musicians. So this is where I put my notice saying drummer wanted who can play better than Ginger Baker and Mitch Mitchell and um, John Bonham. And of course, Roger answered the advert. He phoned me up and said, yeah, I can do all that. What do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the first place that Roger and I ever played. I remember him bringing his kit in very carefully and he set it all up on its stands. And then he started to do something very curious. He was like making little tapping noises and turning knobs. And I, and I went, what are you doing? And he said, I'm tuning the drums. And I went, oh, really? You tune drums? Because the drummers that I'd worked with up to that time just basically put the drums down and hit them. But Roger was going around and tuning every little part of each skin so that it would resonate in the right way. So I was kind of impressed. <laughs> Roger and I sowed the first seeds of what became Queen right here in this little tiny jazz club room here when Roger first started um, setting his drums up and I brought the guitar in. And it, it is a little strange that we went through all this amazing journey and then there's really there's just the two of us left now so it is kind of a full circle and I sat in hospital for quite a while thinking about all this but with all these wonderful memories of the tour going around in my head and that's when I wrote um, Now I'm Here Now I'm Here was a sort of in a sense a chronicle of that tour and um, I remember thinking, I wonder if I'm ever going to get out of here and actually be able to play this. Um, eventually we did. I had many memories of that time. I remember the boys, they were still working on. And I think we'd done the backing track for Killer Queen and they brought it in with some harmonies on. And me being precocious boy went, I don't like them. <laughs> you know, they sound too harsh. Now, I don't know if I was right or I was wrong, but Freddie went, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, we'll go back and do them again. So they actually waited until I came out to redo the harmonies and we redid them. So Killer Queen would have sounded very abrasive. I don't know if that stuff is still around it, maybe, I don't know. But we redid them and, and they became a bit more, um, a bit more melodious, I suppose. Um, but, you know, the boys came in. I also remember they brought me in a, a toy, which was the very first video game. It was like a box like this, with a knob at each end like this, and all you could do was, it was tennis, I suppose. All you could do, you had a paddle at each end, and this dot went across your TV screen, and you go bing, bing. And uh, I remember thinking, oh, this is gonna catch on. <laughs> so I remember playing that in the hospital. Um, the awful thing was, I had this operation done, there's a big long scar from here to here, you know, they don't do that operation anymore, but obviously they, they opened me all up and did the whole thing on my stomach. And the worst thing is when you laugh, you know, when you're trying to recover from this stuff, you do not want to be laughing because it's the most painful thing in the world. So, you know, the people who thought they were funny would come in and tell me jokes. And <laughs> so I was grateful to have this video game so I could just play without laughing, but amuse myself in a sense. And I did some painting in there. I remember I did some, you know, some watercolour painting in there. It was a bit of a long, it was a bit of a long haul back to to health. But all the time the, the songs were going around in my head as well and I was just hoping that I would get back out there and finish the album, which we eventually did. I remember Freddie was very considerate and very caring and he must have known that I was sitting in hospital thinking, I wonder if they're going to go on without me, you know, and I remember him coming in and saying, you just get better, dear. He said, you know, we'll wait for you. It doesn't matter how long it takes, you know, we're not going to do anything without you. You know, just get better. So it was a very nice thing that, that Freddie did very early on. And, um, yeah, Freddie was like that. You know, he could, be, he could be kind of abrasive at times, but there was a lot of caring in that man. And uh, 
he was incredibly loyal to us, incredibly loyal to me, I remember, and very um, supportive. Um, you know, I, I can remember him, you know, he would surprise you, Freddie. I remember coming in one day late to the studio and Freddie was sitting there with a big smile on his face. And I said, what's he been doing then? You know, and he said, oh, you won't see. He said, just listen to this, darling, just listen to this. And he put on this tape and it was a compilation of every guitar solo that I'd ever played and he'd woven them into some kind of tapestry. I wish I still had the tape, I don't know where it is. But he, you know, he said, I wanted to immortalise your solos. He just had a few minutes, you know, and it was a great little thing. He said, here you are, you know, this is... Uh, and he's, he signed it for me, you know, like... <laughs> and, um, you know, which is... It was a very nice thing to do, you know, just to sort of make me feel um, <laughs> appreciated, I guess, you know. I first met Queen uh, when I was a solicitor at Harbottle & Lewis in London and I was a partner and I was running what was then a very fledgling music department. And Queen had actually met uh, my partner, Charles Leveson, before me, but Charles had left the firm and they set up an appointment to see me. At Harbottle & Lewis was a show business firm and we were used to fairly bizarre clients. But I remember when Queen arrived, the uh, receptionist telephoned me and said, uh, Mr. Beach, Queen are here. And I said, yes, fine. Uh, would you like to send them up? And she whispered down the phone. She said, have you seen them? And I said, well, yes. And she said, well, um, one of them's got nail varnish on. <laughs> and I said, well, really? Yes, black nail varnish. And I said, well, fine. And he said, but it's only on one hand. <laughs> and uh, I said, let me think, come on, send them up. And they walked in. And I've always remember Freddie walked in first. Um, they sat down and Freddie kicked straight off by saying, uh, uh, we've recorded three albums, our manager's just bought his second Rolls Royce and we're on 60 quid a week, so something's wrong. And I got involved in negotiating them out of their contract with the Sheffield brothers. Mm. Ah, the B-side thing is a whole kind of nest of worms. <laughs> B-sides. Yeah, yeah. Well, the classic. Well, OK, okay it, it doesn't happen now, but in those days, a single had two sides to it. It's a piece of plastic, it's a piece of, piece of vinyl. On this side is a record which probably every radio station is going to play, if you're lucky. On the other side is a track which probably almost nobody is going to play and nobody's going to care about, but it's just on there because the record has two sides. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it goes back years and years and years. Occasionally you'd have a double A side so people could play both sides, but normally it was nothing. Now, <laughs> what happens is, when it comes to getting paid, the record royalties for writing the tracks are split 50-50 between the A side and the B side, which is clearly an unfair situation, but that's the way it was. So whoever got the B-side got a free bonus. He got a great, you know, wadge of money from nowhere. And um, there was always some kind of resentment would go on. The classic case, of course, as, as Roger will tell you himself, you know, is um, I'm in love with my car was with the B-side of Bohemian Rhapsody. So I'm in love with my car became one of the biggest earners in terms of a, of a song of all time. So we were all a bit like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it became a joke, you know, and uh, Roger probably got un unfairly victimised for it, but he enjoyed it, I think. I think he enjoyed spending the money, so um, it's fine. But, you know, we were always kind of aware of that stuff, so we tried to share out the, the B-side so that we would... Because there's no other reason of having a B-side except, as I say, because it, it's, it's possible to put a track on there. Um, of course, it all changes later on because... CD singles are different. You can put quite a few tracks on them. And these days, a single seems to be a track that you download and that's it. So it, it's, a, it's a long forgotten nest of worms and I'm quite glad that it's, uh, it's over, really. I'll tell you who are a great B-side band is Oasis. Like, Oasis is B-sides, arguably are better than the A side in some cases and they were ones that would put you'd get free B sides 
to the single so you'd get four tracks on it and then three tracks that aren't on the album and honestly some of their best stuff is on the b-sides honestly yeah a lot more of their like more quirkier stuff but yeah hold on two secs yeah before we carry on as well now i'm here since they mentioned it that's the one i always still because it's now i'm here Still to this day, if I haven't thought about that song for ages and I think, I think, oh, what's that song? I will always go, here I am. Always. And that's why I, I'll never find it. But yeah, let's go. Do you remember that the first time you saw that Harlequin outfit? It was probably, it was in America, wasn't it? I can't, no, I can't remember the very first time, no, no. But the first one was just white, I think. I, we thought we called him Kermit. So that was his <laughs> Kermit outfit. <laughs> I remember the look on the road crew's face. Was, they were astounded. He came out in ballet pumps and a Kermit. A white satin Kermit, Kermit the Frog, you know. <sighs> God, admit, he had some nerve, didn't he? Started it off in England actually. We had some time off, and um, another great bass. I'd always wanted to do something a little bit more that was more sort of disco, really, which was very uncool at the time. You know, it wasn't the sort of thing. You know, uh, but l luckily in a way it came out quite heavily. But I started it off with actually a completely different set of lyrics. It was all about cowboys, which is why the, the American phrase "Another one bites the dust" came in really. But then I thought that was very silly. I, the, the never, I never even got to show that to the band. But I decided to change it before then. So I, you know, I changed the lyrics all together and uh, we recorded it in Munich a lot of it really and Freddie helped out a little bit you know said oh like, we need us something a little bit different there but it was basically old for old for simple really and um, in fact uh, we used um, you know a, a drum loop uh, you know for the thing because it was just so simple and that's all I wanted all the way through something just solid really and that was the way of doing it because really. it wasn't the sort of music everybody you know we, we played at all really and, and I think uh, the band was as surprised as, as I was that it became so successful, I mean, especially in America. When I did start with the band, they, uh, Freddie and Brian used to be the main songwriters. Uh, they used to write individually, though, most of the time, and then Roger wrote one, really. Um, I think he wrote one on the first album. So Brian and Freddie were the, were the strong force on the compositional side, you know, but Roger was very, had lots of other ideas on behalf of the, um, the overall image of the band and, and, and how to actually, you know, to be a successful rock band, you know. So, um, trying, I mean, I, it, it, there was not really a leader in such because the, no one was really actually so stating everything that was, could be done, and then as the years went on, we all started to contribute, you know, on the on the songwriting side, which helped a lot to sort of balance it out a bit. You know, there was a, a different input as well, because I mean, obviously everybody goes through stale patches where you know you can't come up with much in the way of ideas, and then if, if there's four of you writing, then there's usually there's some strength there somewhere, which helps a lot. We've all had hit singles. I mean, that's really been quite a balancing factor. And uh, that's very rewarding in a way, because I think if I'd just been, a, say, a bass player all my life, you know, with the, with the band, I, it wouldn't be so satisfying to sit here now and sort of that would have been my input, because I don't, I, I, I only consider that as part of what I do. I mean, the actual, the, you know, actually writing songs, having and, and also being involved in the decision-making processes, you know, or arguments or whatever. <laughs> It is nice, you know. I mean, it's, it really feels that you're part of the, you know, of uh, our own destiny, really. We were in New Zealand and uh, on a, for our one big gig in New Zealand, in the big football stadium or whatever it was, rugby stadium, and um, a Tony Hadley from. Uh, Spandau Ballet was there and Fred had been all up to all sorts of tricks and then the two of them got completely assholed in the hotel and uh, we suddenly realised when we were in the dressing room that, that Fred was completely pissed 
because he put his tights on back to front. So, and we we're literally, the music was sort of going, you know, and, and we had to sort of, so with that, there's this frantic, so two people were holding him up down like a chicken bone, you know, like, and, and they were holding him upside down by his feet because that's the only way we could get his tights off and get them on again. And um, it was very, very funny. The first sort of half hour of the gig was terrifying for the three of us because uh, we were playing like Trojans to, to make up for Fred's deficiencies because, you know, normally he's so together and he was just so not together. And he was, <laughs> and he got, he was playing the intro of Somebody to Love, I think it was, and he was just going, oh, God. And then he just banged the piano with his head like that. So, and somehow pulled it together and just, you know, just pulled it all together by sheer force of will. And, you know, uh, it was very, very funny f for a, about half an hour. But you, you, were you ever annoyed? Did you think, oh, what's he done that for? Come on. No, we were just so worried he was going to collapse. Um, that, but uh, he was a tough guy. Mm. Did Hadley come on stage with you? Hadley came on at the end, but couldn't remember a single word of Jail as Rock. But there we are. <laughs>
That's another tune I forget about as well. That is a tune. And it isn't one that I've like proper killed either. It's just a tune I forget about. Queen has had a real kind of disservice done to him by radio. There's so many great things. I've yeah, that is such a tune. Yeah, we go to three twenty. She keeps them always shando in a pretty cabinet with the big cake, she says, just like Marie Antoinette, a building a remedy for Chris Job and Kennedy. At any time, an invitation you can take. Caviar and cigarettes, well versed in etiquette, extraordinarily nice. She's a killer, queen. She never kept the same address In conversation She spoke just like a baroness Middleman from China Went down to get your mind Then again incidentally She was in that way Perfume came naturally From Paris naturally. Because she couldn't care less Prestigious and precise She's a killer Queen Gunfire gelatine Dynamite with a laser beam Guaranteed uh, uh, to blow your mind That's a tune. That's not one I'll forget, to be fair. That is a, uh, yeah, a, a Queen song I've killed. That was kind of hard thinking that out in my head for Killer Queen. The Queen song I've killed, yeah, but yeah, that is one. That is a tune. Also, I was thinking, watching like old, well, I say old Freddy, I mean young Freddy, but there's definitely a Russell Brand, like, like Russell Brand's whole thing. Like, Freddy was on way before. It even reminds me of, like, because if you watch Russell Brand stand up, like, the way he moves like, and spins is very much like what Freddie Mercury does. But I know he's not, like, a crazy Freddie Mercury fan. Really, he likes Morrissey from the Smiths. But yeah, the hair, just the overall look. And I suppose, same Russell Brand, Noel Fielding, too. But yeah. But yeah, anyway, that's part 10. So.